Deep in Shanidar Cave, hidden in the Zagros Mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan, archaeologists found something chilling. The skeleton of a Neanderthal male, now known as Shanidar III, with a deadly wound in his ribs. This injury happened approximately 50,000 years ago. Scientists now debate, was this the first murder between our species? Did early humans kill this Neanderthal? The wound tells a story that could change how we understand our ancient past. The story begins in the 1950s when archaeologist Ralph Selecki started digging in Shanidar Cave with a triangle-shaped entrance 25 meters wide sitting high on Bradost Mountain with views of the greater Zab River below. Selecki first explored in 1951 and came back in 1953 with support from the Smithsonian Institution. His team dug a huge trench in the middle of the cave, going down 14 meters to bedrock. They found layers of history, from modern times all the way back to the Middle Paleolithic period. The most exciting finds came from the bottom layer, layer D. Here they found stone tools typical of Neanderthal culture. Between 1957 and 1960, they discovered several Neanderthal skeletons. On April 16, 1957, a Kurdish worker spotted bones in the trench wall. This was Shanidar III. While most Neanderthal remains went to the Baghdad Museum, Shanidar III's bones were sent to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. This turned out to be crucial for solving the mystery of his death. When scientists T. Dale Stewart and later Eric Trinkhaus examined the skeleton, they noticed something unusual on the left ninth rib, a wound that had started to heal but wasn't fully mended when he died. This meant Shanidar III survived the injury for a while but ultimately died before healing completely. This discovery sparked decades of debate. How did he get this wound? Who or what caused it? And what might it tell us about how Neanderthals and early humans interacted at this critical moment in prehistory. But who was Shanidar III? Careful analysis of his skeletal remains has allowed scientists to build a profile of this Neanderthal man who lived and died roughly 50,000 years ago. Shanidar III was a mature adult male, estimated to be between 40 and 50 years old, relatively old, for a Neanderthal. Standing approximately 1.69 meters tall, or about 5 feet 6 inches, he had the robust build typical of Neanderthals, with powerful muscles and thick bones. Analysis of his arm bones shows developed muscle attachment sites, indicative of the strong shoulders and chest muscles characteristic of his species. Like many Neanderthals who reached older age, Shanidar III showed signs of degenerative joint disease, notably in his right ankle, from an earlier injury that had healed but left him with painful, limited movement. This pre-existing condition may have affected his mobility and made him more vulnerable in certain situations. Evidence shows that Shanidar Neanderthals were skilled in producing Mousterian stone tools, including Les Valois points, used as weapons. They also processed animal hides, with cut marks on bones from the site-matching patterns associated with skinning and tendon removal. But Shanidar III's story doesn't end with his life and abilities. It's his death that has captivated scientists for decades. While examining his remains, researchers discovered something that would transform this ancient Neanderthal into the center of a prehistoric forensic investigation. The key to solving this ancient cold case lies in the wound found on Shanidar III's left ninth rib. The wound is a clean cut on the lower edge of the rib with microscopic evidence of new bone growth around the injury. This tells us 
Shanadar III lived for at least several weeks after being wounded. A weapon would have penetrated his chest cavity, likely damaging his lung and causing either a collapsed lung or leading to an infection. Without antibiotics, either condition could be fatal. The wound's angle and nature provide crucial clues. Whatever pierced Shanadar III's chest came in at a roughly 45-degree downward angle, suggesting he was standing when hit, with his attacker either above him or throwing a weapon from a distance. The clean cut without much crushing or fracturing around it indicates the weapon likely had a sharp edge but didn't hit with massive force. To solve this mystery, scientists needed to experiment. In 2009, Researcher Stephen Churchill and his team at Duke University conducted a groundbreaking study. They made replicas of stone tools from that period and tested them on pig carcasses, which have similar rib cages to humans. They tested two scenarios, high energy impacts, like someone stabbing with a heavy thrusting spear at close range, typical of Neanderthal hunting methods, and Low energy impacts, like lighter projectiles thrown from a distance more associated with early modern humans. The results were clear. High energy impacts caused massive damage, multiple broken ribs, bone fragments, and widespread fracturing. Low energy impacts made cleaner punctures without as much surrounding damage. When they compared these results with Shanadar III's actual wound, his injury lacked the extensive damage typically associated with a thrusting spear. It appeared more consistent with a light projectile weapon. So what does this tell us about who might have attacked Shanadar III? Now that we understand the wound, we can consider the suspects in this prehistoric cold case. There are three possibilities. First, it could have been an accident. Maybe Shanadar III fell onto something sharp or got injured during a hunt. But the clean, precise nature of the wound makes this unlikely. Second, another Neanderthal could have attacked him. Neanderthals certainly fought amongst themselves over food, territory, or mates. The third and most intriguing possibility Shanadar III was killed by a member of our species, Homo sapiens. The timing makes this option compelling, as Shanadar III died precisely when modern humans were moving into Western Asia from Africa, entering lands that Neanderthals had controlled for hundreds of thousands of years. The weapon technology provides the most compelling clue. While Neanderthals primarily used heavy thrusting spears designed for close combat, early modern humans developed more advanced projectile technology like lightweight spears that could be thrown from a distance, possibly using spear throwers to increase power and range. While the attacker's identity remains speculative, the timing overlaps with one of the most critical periods in human evolution, when Homo sapiens and Neanderthals first shared territory. If this interpretation holds, we may be witnessing the earliest forensic evidence of interspecies conflict. By about 100,000 years ago, early modern humans had begun moving out of Africa into the Middle East. By 50,000 years ago, Homo sapiens were established in Western Asia and beginning to spread into Europe. As humans expanded, Neanderthals declined, going extinct in most places by 40,000 years ago. This overlap in time and space raises the big question, what happened when Neanderthals and modern humans met? Did they live peacefully side by side? Did they interbreed? Or was there competition and conflict? We know interbreeding happened. Most people of Eurasian descent today carry approximately 1 to 2% Neanderthal DNA. But this doesn't rule out competition or conflict. The archaeological record shows the two species had different technologies and strategies. 
Modern humans developed more sophisticated throwing weapons, built wider social networks, used more diverse food sources, and possibly had more complex, symbolic thinking. These advantages may have given Homo sapiens the edge, especially during the harsh climate swings of the Ice Age. The case of Shanidar III gives us a possible glimpse into this competitive relationship. Anthropologist Pat Shipman calls it the invader's advantage. Other possible cases of violence between the species are rare but suggestive. A Neanderthal from Saint-Césaire, France, dating to around 36,000 years ago, has a healed skull fracture that might be from interpersonal violence. The experimental work on Shanidar III's wound led researcher Stephen Churchill to a sobering conclusion. If they perceived Neanderthals as ecological rivals and had the ability to displace them by coalitional killing, they probably did so. But the evidence doesn't support a simple story of humans violently wiping out Neanderthals. The truth was likely more complex, involving climate change, population shifts, competition for resources, and possibly disease, alongside occasional violent encounters. What Shanidar III gives us isn't proof of systematic violence between species, but rather a single, poignant example of what might have been happening during this crucial transition. One Neanderthal, who died from a wound that bears the technological signature of our own ancestors. Beyond the forensic details, Shanidar III's case comes at a critical moment in human history, when our species was expanding across the globe and encountering other human species who had evolved separately for hundreds of thousands of years. His wound gives us a rare, tangible connection to this pivotal transition. What makes this evidence so compelling is how it connects innovation to competition. The projectile technology that likely killed Shanidar III represents a breakthrough that would continue developing over thousands of years. This ability to innovate, to create tools that extend our physical capabilities, is a defining feature of our species. But as Shanidar III reminds us, innovation has often been linked to violence as well as progress. Perhaps the most powerful aspect of this ancient cold case is how it humanizes both victim and suspect. Shanidar III wasn't just a fossil. He was a person who lived, had relationships, hunted, made tools, and ultimately died from a violent encounter. His attacker was also a person operating within their cultural knowledge, using their technology to survive in a harsh world where resources were scarce and competition was fierce. The investigation into Shanidar III continues. In recent years, new excavations led by researchers from the University of Cambridge have returned to the site, using modern archaeological techniques that weren't available during Selecki's original work. In 2018, they discovered another Neanderthal skeleton dubbed Shanidar Z, located close to where the famous flower burial was found. As we continue to uncover evidence from our evolutionary past, the case of Shanidar III stands as a powerful reminder that the tools of modern science can illuminate even the coldest of cold cases, a possible murder that occurred 50,000 years ago at a pivotal moment in the human journey.